Thank you. Can everyone else come up from, for the panel? Is everyone else here for, to come up? Yeah. So, uh, I um, am the co-founder of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, and it's so good to be here in person with everyone. And uh, we're very proud to be a co-sponsor of this event and also very relieved that we didn't have to do any of the organizing. So thank you, Mary Ann, and all your crew. Back in 1989, when the fatwa was first issued against Salman Rushdie, uh, Dan suggested that we put a slogan on a new T-shirt that we were selling Blasphemy is a victimless crime. And over the years, we've had to reissue it, such as in 2015, uh, after Avajit Roy and all the executions of many of the Bangladesh atheists. And um, this fall, we are again reissuing this T-shirt. Sadly, 33 years after that first uh, fatwa was issued. And blasphemy is a victimless crime, but Blasphemy laws and persecutions create all too many victims. Um, this panel is called Blasphemy, Islamophobia, and Free Expression. Why is the right to face blasph why is the right to face blasphemy, um, free expression, and conscience important for dissent? I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> How is blasphemy linked to free thought? Are there limits to free expression? So that's what we'll be talking about. And we'll begin with brief remarks by Jimmy Bangash. Then I will introduce the other panelists. Jimmy, am I saying that right, Bangash? Bangash is a spokesperson for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain and is a psychotherapist social, specializing in working with ex-Muslims and Muslim heritage LGBT. And he works to provide mental health support and awareness to the plight of apostates and LGBTQ Islamic communities. Thank you, everyone. It's really good to see everybody and be reunited after such a long time. I think these conferences are so invigorating uh, and provide a lot of energy. Love you too. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, so as, uh, as I was introduced, I'm a spokesperson for Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. I'm also a psychotherapist and my work specializes really on LGBT of um, Muslim heritage. And that's both looking at sort of how this phenomena occurs in the Western world so you know what we come up against is a lot of not being able to criticize islam because we're labeled as islamophobes uh, and also in its most brutal form where we see it in muslim majority countries uh, um, and how lgbtq people in those communities are treated so all of the countries in the world that have the death sentence of being gay are exclusively muslim majority countries i think um when we think about the title of the panel which is about blasphemy for my own story you know it's not unusual um, being a, a gay person of Muslim heritage growing up in a Western country to experience the ardent homophobia that exists within our community people talking about gay people needing to be executed or shunned for their families or at best live lives of abs abstinence and chastity um, within my own life before I took issues with the rules in Islam around homosexuality I really was aware at a very young age of the inequitable treatment of my sisters and my mother compared to my brothers and my father. There was also a lot of domestic violence in my house and that was sanctioned by a verse in the Quran called verse 434, which gives instructions under what circumstances you should beat your wife. And there's also hadith which provide uh, guidance that 
we shouldn't question a man around how he hits his wife or when he hits his wife. So within that sort of theological framework, this domestic violence was um, permitted. Yeah, And to bring it back to the panel, I think for me, for my 20s, I wouldn't have been able to say to someone, actually, I'm a non-believer, I don't believe in Islam. Even though I wasn't living a religious life, when people would ask me if I was Muslim, I'd say, oh, I was born Muslim, or I grew up Muslim. It was only when I started hitting my 30s and I saw blasphemous women like Ayan Hussi Ali and Mariam Namazi on YouTube, and what they were able to do was you know, pull into a coherent narrative all of these disparate thoughts that I had about Islamic homophobia or Islamic misogyny or theological issues and construct real robust narratives that I could you know, push rewind on and watch several times or share with a friend. And these narratives were inherently blasphemous. They were just saying things that you were not allowed to say out loud about Islam. And something in that was emancipating. You know, if we think about uh, blasphemy laws as imprisonment or a cage on your thoughts, the acts of blaspheming then is about uh, breaking out of that cage. And I think that's why we need to do it, is because what we're doing is we're saying, actually, you don't need to be caged anymore. We can kick down these walls. We can give you space to think. And just from the comments from the deputy mayor, you know, I think if we're genuine, if we, if we are really honest about this, there was a statement in there about not dissuading people from their beliefs. But I want to be really clear that if you believe a woman should be beaten by her husband, if you believe that a gay person should be executed for homosexuality, I am passionately attempting to dissuade you from that belief. Wow, you did it in less than five minutes. <laughs> Said a lot. Now I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel. I'll introduce everybody and then we'll uh, take brief uh, introductory statements. So you've already met um, Sammy uh, Abdullah, who's president of Free Thought Lebanon, now residing in Germany. And he's a theoretical physicist by profession. And he's co-founder and president of Free Thought Lebanon, created in 2007. And is it Halima or Halima? Halima Salat is with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. She's a spokesperson for it. She's a Kenyan Somali activist now living in the Netherlands, a journalist, poet, and activist who focuses on sex-based rights for minority women. Yay, Halima. Yay, Halima. <laughs> Susan McIntyre is CEO of Atheist Republic. She was raised by a conservative Catholic family and left religion at 15. Good taste. <laughs> she works to promote secularism around the world. And I should say, unfortunately, that we were supposed to have Ibn Warwick here. His health precluded his travel. His doctor said, you can't travel. So we'll miss him. And also, Ali Rivsvi, uh, was also uh, scheduled to speak and was uh, um, he had to bow out. But we're very grateful to have our current panelists. And why don't we start with, uh, with Susanna? Can you hear me? Oh, fantastic. Um, hi, I'm Susanna. Um, <laughs> President and CEO of Atheist Republic. Um, we're very centered around providing community for atheists around the world, particularly in countries where gathering in person like we are today um, is a dangerous endeavor. So providing that online community where people otherwise cannot find it is really critical and can um, help provide a lot of sense of uh, community and uh, help prevent loneliness, um, something I'm very passionate about. Um, any other opening statements? Did you want to say a little bit about your, your own story and maybe the blasphemy laws in Ireland? Ireland? I mean, that got... Uh, I'm sorry, that were... You used to have blasphemy laws recently in Ireland that were voted out. Did you want to address that? Oh, I'm 
sorry, I don't know about Ireland, but um, I'm oh, I'm, I'm American. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm and um, sorry, so in, in terms of um, blasphemy issues where I'm from, you know, my rights are luckily very gratefully protected by the First Amendment. So um, I'm lucky enough to not have this be a concern in my life and um, something that I have to think about in terms of being criminalized. And um, I think in my recent development or a more recent past development, I've, I've come to appreciate that on a whole different level. And I've developed a sense of duty and responsibility to put that to good use um, and talk about these issues for the people who are not able to um, without safety. And um, it's, it's kind of funny because and although it's protected in my country, I have had some legal issues in countries I'm not even a citizen of, like India, for example. I've had uh, police reports filed against me for blasphemy there. So... It's not my country, but I have to deal with it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sal Salim. Would you like to go next? Ah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Halima. I'm, uh, I was actually in for nine years in the closet uh, as an ex-Muslim. I knew I didn't believe, but I couldn't say. And... And, and this, this uh, panel is called Blasphemy, Islamophobia, and Free Speech. Now, technically, there are no blasphemy laws in the country I come from. That's Kenya. But Kenya borders Somalia, and I am ethnically Somali. So I'm blasphemous to the Somali community, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, in a sense, sometimes the blasphemy law, there are 13 countries obviously that's got um, where apostasy and blasphemy are punishable by the state. However, there are also backdoor, I would say, blasphemy laws towards uh, especially apostates who are public, hence, you know, why we're all very, very secure right now yeah. in Germany. <laughs> um, so um, I hope that gives an introduction. Oh, then we'll talk about like uh, ex-Muslim Somalis is an online community. Majority of the people I am in touch with, actually, I would say 98% are in the closet. Majority of them live in Western countries. And that, is, that just tells me how difficult it is to basically say you, you don't believe in something. You just, you don't believe. Um, and that, that very existence of you don't believe in itself is blasphemous. So, I hope that's a good introduction. Mm -hmm. or did you? Uh, are there examples of blasphemy persecutions in Somali ongoing? Of course. Um, the, was it 2020? We, Mariam was also involved in this case. The, the, there was a a university professor who was uh, accused of, for posting, it was such a really silly Facebook post talking about, um, he, I remember, I'm paraphrasing, but I remember he said something like, um, instead of praying to Allah, why don't we, uh, Somalia, ha Somalia has drought and uh, you know it's a, it's a very dry, arid area, why don't we look for drought mitigation methods on a Facebook post? And he was arrested, he was jailed, and his, his children were targeted, his wife was targeted, so yeah, so uh, Somalia is among the 13 countries. Thank you. And um, Sammy, what about Lebanon and persecution of blasphemy or your own experiences? Yeah, so, um, so what I love about these conferences is that we always get to talk about our countries, you know, and to hear the stories from other countries. So Lebanon is a small country in the Middle East. And uh, so we do have four penal codes in Lebanon which are used to fight blasphemy. And, uh, but I would say in Lebanon that the main concern is not from the law, from the government, it's more from the society. So these laws, they are used more in a political way. So whenever there's some statement the government doesn't agree with, 
they would use one of those laws like incitement of sectarian strife or something like this. Uh, but the biggest pressure comes, I would say, from the society because there's like internal s like blasphemy laws in the society. So people, for example, they cannot blaspheme within their own families, communities, and so on. Uh, there have been quite um, many blasphemy uh, cases in Lebanon, like people who were, for example, uh, yeah, there's the case. Um, actually, we do have a little exhibition on our booth outside in which we are presenting like blasphemy cases in Lebanon. Uh, but there's quite a few that, was, that were done by the government, and there's also like people who were who had to leave, they were kicked from their jobs because they found out they were atheists, for example, or something like this. So I'm looking forward for the discussion. I'm looking forward to disagreeing with you because this is when the discussion gets interesting and when we learn. Uh, yeah. Do you think we're going to disagree with each other? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so uh, Halima and Sami, did you leave your countries because of being a free thinker? Did you, were you compelled to leave for your freedom of conscience? Um, I would say yes and no. Okay, so I in a sense, I I left because in my society in northeastern Kenya, um, or even in the capital city of Nairobi, um, the the community policing and the community ownership of women is so high that the freedom to do, uh, to, to walk without the hijab, to, to you know, w whatever I wanted to do with my own life, the individual choices are curtailed. So then you, you don't feel, so I left. And, and, and the reason I couldn't, even though technically Kenya doesn't have any blasphemy or apostasy laws, I couldn't say, is also God is really big in Africa. And so, um, even the the Christian population does not like atheists, so you wouldn't get any protection from the police, for example. Um, the government would be very lax, like, oh, you, you said you're an atheist? Mm. You know? So, I in a sense, it's still dangerous to be an atheist uh, in, 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 in there. So I couldn't really say. But I felt like when I moved and I came to a free country, it was very important that I say because of the people who couldn't say. If that makes any sense. And Sammy, what about you? Uh, in my case, it's also yes and no. Uh, there's so many reasons why people leave Lebanon. It's, it's becoming the, I mean, the norm to leave the country. You know, the bad economy and everything. Uh, in my case, there was so many contributing factors, and of course, some of them were that I did feel shunned in my society and my family. And yeah, they all built up, and then I decided that I do not belong there, and I just wanted to leave. And yeah, I've been here for five years, but I mean, I'm physically here, but we are working in Lebanon. All of our work is in Lebanon, and uh, yeah. Would you be free to go back after the, your work here? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do visit once a year, yeah. So, um, Jimmy, you have a different story where you, you were born in London of Pakistani parents, is that right? Yes. But yet right. you were forced to leave your family. Do you want to talk about that? Um, I'm a little bit bored of talking about it, but I will do it for you guys. <laughs> uh, so um, I think what's really interesting is, is kind of how there's been a shift in the gay Muslim movement or, or, or even just the ideas around it. So when I was 23, which is about 20 years ago, despite this youthful visage <laughs> before you. So um, if you were gay, you were an apostate. So there was no there was no choice. It was like you're either gay or you're Muslim, and and you, you would see that on debates on TV, uh, uh, on the BBC and such. And there's been some sort of evolution of that now, which kind of mimics actually uh, the theological position of uh, the Christian right. And um, that evolution has become actually being gay isn't the sin, so long as you're not having gay sex. Then, so if you're gay and you're abstaining then you're still in God's favor. It's only if you're actually having sex that there's an issue there. And um, that, that phase, uh, love the sinner, hate the sin. Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of been adopted by um, 
Muslims, uh, and I think they would deny that they're adopting this Christian thing, but it's, it's generally what they're doing. But so back when, I, when my parents and my family found out, I was 23, uh, and th you know it was, it was really quite scary, actually. So they found out, and then they said, you've got a week to get out of this house. Uh, no, sorry, they, said they found out and they were like, actually, you've got a week to get out of the house. I managed to negotiate a bit longer um, and so then moved out. And I was completely ostracized by all of my siblings, apart from one sister and my mum, who, who, who tried to stay in contact with me. Ostracism is being shunned like that is a completely traumatic event. Like, there's so much to deal with. This is your, your, your primary caregivers who are supposed to be there for you and look after you. Um, and actually, they're the people who are turning on you. And in this really perverse twist in the world, it then becomes wider society that is almost accepting you more than your family does. And, and you would expect that to be the other way around. Um, two years after being disowned, I, I got a promotion with my work and it moved me back uh, uh, geographically towards where my family was. And then things got really ugly. It became... Um, there were just threats on my physical safety, uh, assassination threats, uh, and I lived for about a year. Just looking back now, I can see I was in a state of terror. Like I was always really cold. I didn't want to leave the house. I would just go to work and then come back home. Um, it was quite a frightening time, but it got to the point where I had to get the police involved so that the threats would stop and then fall away. So yeah, it was pretty horrific. I would like to say it's not normative, it doesn't happen a lot, but I don't think that's true. I think for a lot of people who are Muslim and uh, were gay at that time period, that was quite a common uh, experience, yeah? It may have lessened some uh, over the years, but I still think we have to be realistic. And, and when we look at the last poll on uh, British Muslims' attitudes towards homosexuality, 52% of them said that it should be criminalized. Um, and that's a you know, pretty damning statistic. Thank you. And uh, Susanna, uh, just briefly, in a way, you have a little bit of a parallel story, even though you were raised Catholic uh, because of your own um, sexuality, you realized you um, had to leave the church. Is that right? Catholic? Yes, well, I feel like as uh, any young teenager realizing that they are not heterosexual, you at least me, I quickly come to the realization that if I'm not only going to cognitively survive, but cognitively thrive, I have to leave this ideology that is telling me that all these aspects of myself are uh, worthy of condemnation and abhorrent. Um, and yeah, as a, a developing young person, you're like, I have to get out of here. <laughs> yes, um, I think uh, it's, it's a very difficult experience in its own ways, but I, I've, I've been extremely lucky in comparison to many other people I know, so I have a lot to be grateful for. And attitudes have shifted greatly also yes. in the United States. Yes. They're shifting back, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, in the Muslim world, um, if you're gay, you're an apostate, if you're a non-believer, uh, you're committing blasphemy, um, uh, and yet... Um, we're being told that if we criticize Islam, we're Islamophobic. So let's talk about that. Who, who wants to talk first? I've been dying. <laughs> I've, been dying. I've been dying to like just simply say the, the fact that the, the, the panel was called blasphemy, Islamophobia, and free speech. The fact that Islamophobia and free speech are in the same sentence is really disturbing me because they can't be. Because the, 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 the word, I don't know, the word, Islamophobia has is exactly been in, invented to curtail free speech in criticizing Islam. Because you can't, you can't be phobic about an idea. Ideas are supposed to be criticized all the time until they are okay ideas. I mean, now, hatred towards Muslim people, which I like to call, uh, um, what was the word we used? Anti-Muslim bigotry. Anti-Muslim bigotry, exactly. Now, that in itself is, is a different category to just using Islamophobia, Islamophobia, because 
what the the fascist, the religious fascist and the Islamist basically want with the word Islamophobia is to stop people thinking critically about Islam and the harmful ideas that are there and, and, and the, the lack of freedom for women and LGBT people and all of that. So I, I, if we can edit and say <laughs> blasphemy, Islamophobia and lack of <laughs> free speech. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> just, you know, it, 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 was, it was really uh, knocking my head that the, those, those two appeared in the same sentence. Please go ahead. Oh, what I find really interesting to think about is the ways in which other um, religious right movements have co-opted this idea of Islamophobia in their own ways. Um, so while I have been accused of Islamophobia, as I'm assuming everyone else here on this panel has, <laughs> or many other people in this conference, um, what I've actually been accused of more is now Hindu phobia. So ironically, um, the Hindu far-right movement uh, gaining vast amounts of momentum within India and actively eroding secularism within the world's largest secular democracy has started to adopt many of the tactics of the Islamists that they hate so much, including co-opting this term of, oh, if you criticize us, you're phobic of us. And um, I think this is something that uh, we, as secular activists should be paying attention to uh, as well, because um, then now I'm seeing Christian phobia as well. Like everyone wants to co-opt this idea of the phobia um, for their own purposes, to be able to shut down conversation, shut down criticism, and um, do it under the guise of uh, you are hating me as a person, when that's simply not the case. So I'm beginning to think if you haven't been accused of being phobic, you're not doing a very good job <laughs> by this point. Um, so. I just touch on two points. So in 2017, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain marched in gay pride. And we were, you know, pride is, is, is supposedly a welcoming space to challenge uh, religious homophobia, political homophobia, cultural homophobia. Uh, so there's a really standard place where you would go and, and challenge um, religion and its views on uh, LGBT issues. Uh, and we were walking around with signs that said things like Allah is gay and uh, fuck Islamic homophobia, I've been allowed to swear here. Um, uh, we're here, we're kafir, all sorts of things that were you know, really kind of clever and witty. And um, what was astonishing was that when we were getting ready to march, we had uh, the police come and descend on us and tell us that our signs were offensive and that we should put them down. And just across from us were like some people with Christian signs, like mocking Christianity. The police could not have been caring less about them. It was just fascinating to see um, the difference in how Islam was treated. Uh, of course, we managed to march. We were then um, suspended pending investigation for eight months. Uh, after the eighth month or so, they came and met with us. They understood that we weren't uh, into anti-Muslim bigotry. I think that was their concern. But it was just astonishing to see, like, here we are criticizing this religion, and the police are literally on uh, in front of us trying to stop us from doing so. And I want to touch on this point, prob probably very controversially, but we're trying to disagree with each other here. <laughs> so when you talk about this, this idea of Christian phobia, of Hindu phobia, and actually, you know, that phobe being used to silence people, I really think we have to talk about what is becoming a new religious orthodoxy, and that's the term transphobia. Is that whenever... <laughs> not, not as controversial as I thought, so that, that's good to hear. I, I think whenever we're, we're seeing women stand up for sex-based rights, and it comes into conflict with what is seen as trans rights, there is this tendency to call people a transphobe. Um, and, and I think, you know, regrettably, I would say with Atheist Republic, I've seen videos where Richard Dawkins or uh, J.K. Rowling are uh, mischaracterized in their arguments, saying that actually they don't know the difference between gender and sex. And if you have listened to J.K. Rowling, or if you've read through her transcript on her position on sex-based rights, she's really clear that actually this is what gender is, this is what sex is, sex matters to women in spaces because of safety, because of modesty, decency, and dignity. 
And actually, we must not replace sex with gender when uh, we are looking at what, where women's sex-based rights are. So I think we've got to be really cautious about all religious orthodoxy. And I say this as somebody who, you know, uh, as a psychotherapist, works with trans people across the globe in really hideous situations. Like, if you work with people in Muslim countries around LGBT issues as a psychotherapist, it, it is really stark, sobering uh, work. But that doesn't mean that we don't challenge whenever we see it people trying to trample all over women's rights and uh, trying to, you know, essentially what we're having is biological males, whether it's Sharia or gender ideology, biological males telling women what they can do, what they can't think, where they should be, who they should be with, where they can go, and what they mustn't do. It's not acceptable. I have to say that in the United States, we're not allowed to use the word women when we talk about abortion rights. People with uteruses or people who can get pregnant, that's the new orthodoxy. I think we should include everybody, but I think that we should call people what they want to be called so we can say women and we can say people who can become pregnant, Let's include both. But anyway, so we do see a lot of that. Um, briefly, Susanna, did you want to reply before we ask Sammy about how we uh, counter Islamophobic um, assertions? Um, I think for myself personally, um, it's something I continue to chew over in many different ways. Um, so I, I like to listen to um, all people. I understand the positions of many different sides. I'm deeply sympathetic um, to many sides. And um, hmm. I think I'm still working to decide for myself um, what's the best way to move forward for people. Can I just jump in for one quick reason? Because I think people might be wondering about the relevance here to you know, we're holding a conference around uh, Islamophobia and ex-Muslims, etc. It's, it's important to know that there's, there's, there's not a huge number of ex-Muslim activists across the world. And there's particularly not a huge number of female ex-Muslim activists across the world. But I can give you examples of people in this room who are ex-Muslim female activists who have been cancelled talking about religious freedom because they hold true that women should have sex-based rights. So I think sometimes we want to, might want to see this as, you know, the conversation about gender ideology and trans and homosexuals over here, and the conversation about Islam uh, and religion over here. They're not so distinguishable from each other. That's not how conversations about rights work, they do conflict. And we know this because consistently conflicting is the conversation around religious rights and religious freedom and homosexuality and the LGBT issue. So Sammy, you didn't get a chance to talk about uh, how do we counter this idea that if you criticize the Muslim religion, um, you are an Islamophobe. Uh, so first I think we should make a differentiation between Muslim and Islam. So a Muslim is a person Islam is a set of ideas, and as we know, people have rights, but ideas don't. And this is why, uh, usually I use the term Muslimophobia if I want to refer to the hatred towards refugees coming from Islamic countries. But I think the term Islamophobia, if we are referring to Islam as a religion, I think it's, it's totally justifiable. It's a justifiable fear. I have no problem with the idea as long as we're referring to a set of ideas. So there's some things that you read in the Quran or in the Hadith that, of course, you're going to be scared when you read them if you happen to live in an Islamic country or so. So, uh, yeah, this is my input. So just to insert um, uh, the United States into this, this month is the uh, 10th anniversary of the, um, the massacre at, uh, at an, a Sikh temple, Oak Creek Temple, in my state of Wisconsin, where uh, uh, people are very mixed up in the United States. Terrorists are mixed up between Muslims and Sikhs, and the Sikhs have really gotten it sometimes. 
And so uh, in the United States, people tend to look at Islamophobia as, oh, we mustn't do anything that would spur an attack like this. This was the worst attack at a religious uh, congregation um, at the time, it's gotten worse. Uh, the, the attack against the t synagogue recently was worse. And so, uh, any thoughts on that? You know that um, th that we're roiling the waters. We are contributing to violence against a minority in a, a country like the United States or in in European countries. I think it's very. Um I understand it. I, it comes from a place of empathy, and it comes from a very good place of goodwill. Um, and I can be very appreciative of that. Um, uh, 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 the, the desire to protect the minority, I think, is very noble. And it's a value that I share very deeply. Um, but within that, we need to recognize that there is multiplicity within that minority, and that that minority can be harmful to the minority within the minority. And um, so I see myself as speaking up for those people. Um, who are uh, even more uh, marginalized within the margin. <laughs> and um, I think it's also important to think of it as a very good sense of goodwill towards a larger um, minority group to um, a desire for um, to hopefully inspire conversation um, and inspire a certain amount of um, progression or self-reflection within that community about um, the mistreatment of others. And um, so I think it, it comes from a very good place. Um, it, For example, the majority, the vast majority of those who are criminalized or killed, violently assaulted for blasphemy, for apostasy, are Muslims. It is in the best interest of Muslims to be having these conversations, to be normalizing blasphemy, um, because they're the ones who are most frequently harmed by it. Um, so I think it's actually in their best interest. If I can just jump in, the fact that you know uh, we must not stir up whatever, I, I, it's kind of a little bit insulting to people of the minority. Uh, you may say it's homogenizing us in such a way that we don't have diversity of thought within ourselves to decide if, like you know, you, you want to leave religion. So just this homogenizing and putting people in one box and pushing them to think exactly the same way is insulting, to be honest. Is this, <laughs> There's also something quite short-sighted about it, isn't it? Because I do agree with Susanna in that it's this kind of well-meaning, um, protectionist sort of stance that people are taking, saying, oh, look, don't criticize the Muslims because they're a minority and, and we have to protect them. But maybe also because now, if, if, if you're, uh, you know, in, in the West, we've kind of won so many of our rights that people forget what the trajectory was or what we had to go through to get here. So they don't understand that actually by, you know, trying to form the consensus that Halima was referring to is what you're doing is stemming critical thinking. And it's that critical thinking that causes uh, progress to occur within a community. And, you know, the inconsistency, I think you're kind of alluding to this, Susanna, is actually, yeah, you're protecting this group, but the minority within the minority, rather bizarrely, liberals will take a really hostile position to. They're protecting the conservatism within the group. Exactly that. But I think what that mirrors also is actually the attitude that we see towards detransitioners. And when people have uh, gone through the journey of trying to change their um, sex, and then they speak up and say, actually, this, was a, this wasn't a good idea. I wish I had more psychotherapy. I, w I wish I wasn't just given straight gender affirming care. We see that same, the same people who are holding this space for, um, of safety, of, of love, of uh, progress for trans people turn to completely hostile attitudes towards the transitioners, telling them to shut up, be quiet, sit down, and not challenge the narrative. And there's so much mirroring between these two ideologies that it's really quite scary. Okay, so we have 10 minutes left before we're going to open it up to the audience. I did want to ask, is everybody able to hear? No problems? Okay. Um, so, 
this workshop was supposed to ask, uh, can you have free thought without blasphemy, and are there any limits to free expression? So let's open it up to those questions. And who would like to start? Can you give me the first question again one more time? Uh, can you have free thought without blasphemy? No. Which I think we would probably... <laughs> no, as well. I think we'd all say that, right? I mean, no, as well. Because the very, existence of, uh, the very existence of the free thought in you is blasphemous. That's true. Yeah. Sammy, I know that it's foregone, but... <laughs> I think we, we all agree that no. But maybe we can jump to the second bit of the question, is whether there is a limit or not. So where would we draw the limit? And this is a very big debate. We always face this issue, even internally in our organization. We don't all, ag all agree about this. So would somebody like to <laughs> say something about this? And then I would comment. So let's think hate speech. Let's think incitement to violence. Let's think what comes before hate speech. So. Can I jump in? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll be I'll be swift. Actually, I think you know. I think again, you're going to find a consensus on incitement to violence, definitely. But I just want to uh, like introduce this term, which is Islamic fragility. Yeah, uh, you know, I think we're used to the term white fragility. Everyone seems to be on board with it for some bizarre reason. But if we think if we really look at fragility, is this idea of actually. If you criticize Islam, how the Islamic community respond to that is, is, is you know, quite unique uh, in very many ways. When we're looking in the Western world, you can criticize every other single religion and you don't get the similar kind of response. So I think that, you know, we really have to be mindful of this, of this aspect of it. And, you know, one way to approach that would be to handle it with kid gloves, make sure we're really sensitive, make sure we're tone policing our critique of Islam. And the other way of handling it is use blasphemy as the tool it is to just kick down the door. Why apologize? <laughs> There's no, nothing to apologize yeah. for. Exactly, I yeah. agree. Um, I think in terms of limits, a very standard response for me would just be like, yeah, incitement to violence, anything fraudulent, promoting, defrauding people, I think is itself a crime. Um, but besides that, I'm a very hardcore free speech maximalist. <laughs> and I oppose um, hate speech laws, for example. Okay. So Do you disagree with anything? No, no, I don't disagree with anything. <laughs> uh, I think the problem we have when it comes to this topic is the definition of hate speech because you know everything is being labeled as hate speech if you're criticizing a religion you're accused of hate speech and one of the biggest problems for me is that some social media outlets they are uh, like going with the flow like for example facebook are now moving towards equating attacking islam or considering it to be a hate speech you know like if you say I don't know, Islam is a whatever, religion of uh, terror or whatever then. And I th my problem is who defines these things? And like, if let's say Facebook went into this direction, then like, who can undo this damage? Human rights organizations, for example, the Human Rights Watch have been very clear about this. They say that even the, the ridicule, um, to ridicule another religion is a right, you know? But uh, yeah, in my opinion, and I have a very extreme views when it comes to this, that I think even hate speech is free speech at some points. Before you... 100%. Yeah, one of the reasons is that I want stupid people to say stupid things so that I can respond. If I, if I censor them... Yeah, exactly. So if you censor them, they're gonna go on and like continue doing the same somewhere else. So, but of course, there's sometimes a damage that could happen. Um, for example, if you're saying a racist uh, statement and there's, of course, psychological damage or, yeah, it's a slippery slope, but I'm more leaning towards this. <laughs> of course, whenever there's incitement to violence, this is uh, a line that should not be crossed. Yeah, I think there's, um, think? you know, if people want to kill gay people in the name of religion 
I really want to know who you are. Like, I, I don't want you like hanging around in the background with people not being aware that that's your position. Uh, for two reasons. One is actually, actually, you get to make a choice around proximity to those people, but also um, you get to engage with that argument and show how abhorrent it is. Yeah, and you get to show that actually this ideology this argument stems from this ideology and that goes back to dissuading people from subscribing to an ideology that is so abhorrent. Um, for me, I always think about it like the motive and who is defining what hate speech is because if you leave it to the religious institutions, everything, the very fact that we're sitting here is hate speech. Um, so in itself, you, you have if if you if there aren't any um how do i say um unbiased um way to look at uh, what is hate speech in itself everything can be hate speech so i am of the opinion that anything short of saying generalizing people and saying people who believe this are bad um, criticizing any type of idea, including the very sensitive ones, for me is important to be able to have that discourse to progress. Otherwise, censorship and self-censorship and all of that just is a slippery sli slip down the road of you can't say nothing. What's the... <laughs> so... Criticizing an idea is one thing, but Jimmy, when you said, I want to know who wants to kill gays, do you think that uh, Facebook or Twitter should allow people to tweet, kill all gays, kill all apostates, kill all atheists? I mean, is, shouldn't there be a limit? Yeah, this is a good question. I'm, I'm almost absolutist in my commitment to free speech, actually. I do, I really want to know who's thinking what and what they're saying. I think we have choices, so if we don't want to see something, we can turn away from it, we can look away from it. Um, but I think it's really important to be able to hear the ridiculous things that people are thinking, and then believe in the rational capabilities of humanity, that actually we can engage with people and show them why ideas are wrong, and why ideas are bad, and that most people will come to their senses, yeah? Um, I think something is happening that is really uh, is, is really difficult in terms of censorship is now this prioritization of our sensibilities like as if being offended is the worst thing that could ever happen to you like how will you ever get up off the floor if you were offended on a Tuesday like <laughs> that has now become like this is it's almost blasphemous to 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 be offended um, and it's this prioritizing of everybody's right, you know, human right to not be offended, because that's what it seems to be now. Although you don't have a right to not be offended, you have a right to grow up and develop some resilience. Um, and uh, I think by prioritizing this, this need to not offend anybody, you know, this is really bolstering censorship, not just across uh, religion, not just across um, ideologies, but also across you know, things like as fundamental, like art and comedy, um, you know, we see comedians getting cancelled all over the place now. Uh, that the um, what was the the Netflix sh uh, comedian who they tried to cancel? Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. There was a comedian in uh, London, I think, yesterday who they cancelled at another venue because he was too offensive for people. Um, even though he plays much of his uh, comedy in a character, yeah, mm. um, and it's it's becoming really absurd and. Perhaps I am, my pendulum has swung too far the other way. I am open to that idea. But it's just in the face of this need to not offend anybody, uh, uh, resulting sometimes with policemen on your door for things you've sent or said on Twitter, like the insanity of that. Um, I am, I'm kind of like, let people say what they need to say. Let's engage with those arguments. I have a fundamental belief in humanity and their, their ability to engage with rational thinking. But isn't saying kill all uh, Muslims or kill all gay people or kill all atheists, isn't that incitement to violence? Yeah, you're right. And maybe we need to draw a line there, incitement to violence. You are correct. If somebody said, though, 
uh, actually uh, so what you, what you'll get in um, what you what you can do in in Islam is get into complete theological discussions as to why the execution um, punishment is applied like capital punishment is applied I think people should be able to have that discourse and say actually this is why in our religion or in this belief system we have capital punishment this is why it's applied blah 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 I think we have to be able to engage with that because simply saying you can't say that isn't going to stop people who are Muslim who subscribe to Sharia believing that then all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people who are thinking that the death penalty is okay for gays nobody knows who they are we're not able to engage in communication with them. That's just stagnation. Did you have a response, Sammy? I thought you were gonna say that uh, we should not censor such speech, so I was gonna respond. But uh, I think you do agree that we should not openly say that we should kill somebody or... I mean, that's like yes. the fatwa against I do, I do agree. someone I do agree. Mm. We, I do agree, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have explicit we should go and kill the gays. But I do think we need to be able to engage with arguments around what they would see as capital punishment. Because if you're saying that you can't do that, how do we persuade people out of it? Mm -hmm. And let's say you did not attack the person or incite violence against the person, but let's say that you know for a fact that if you raise a certain statement somewhere on Facebook, a damage will happen. Even if the statement was Let's say, for example, I don't know, let's think of a hypothetical village where like, there's Muslims and Hindus, and somebody from the Hindus went and said, uh, Islam is a horrible religion. And then we know that there's high sensitivities, and then if this person does this, then there's going to be death. They're going to be keep people killed. Uh, so this is like actually one thing that was raised by one of the people who work at Facebook, and uh, maybe I'm not supposed to be talking about this, but anyways, the point is that this did happen once. And uh, I, I, don't, I can't remember the exact details, but there was a statement that was against a certain religion, and then because of this statement, which was posted on Facebook, I think around 30 people were killed. And uh, this raises the question, if you know in advance that if you say something, it would cause damages, would you prevent it or not? I think we we do agree for, or like we can. Uh, there's the example, for example, of banning the niqab. I would put this in the same category because the reason we do this is we say for security reasons, and of course this is a violation of personal freedom when you f force somebody not to wear the niqab or what they want to wear. But is it justifiable? For me, if there's a serious security concern and we can prove that there is a security concern, then it becomes justifiable. So, what do you think? I think it's very difficult because in a certain ex to a certain extent when there is a statement that is made that has the potential to cause communal violence, um, there I understand the impulse to say, well, we can't allow these statements. Um, but in a sense, that is not holding the correct people accountable. Who should be held accountable is those who commit violence not who just say a statement. And in fact, that is, this is the very logic that is used to criminalize blasphemers like Mubarak Bala in Nigeria. They said because he made statements, you know, blaspheming the Prophet Muhammad, the lawyers that filed the petition against him said, oh, well, th this is going to cause Muslims to be violent. And so we need to go put you in jail so that we prevent intercommunal intercommunal violence um, in one sense that um, belies a very low opinion of your local Muslim community um, or perhaps it's accurate depending on the situation but it's also holding him accountable for other people's violence that they haven't even committed yet mm -hmm. it's deeply unfair Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> can I just add to that like it's, a, it's a very big slippery slope I totally agree and it can be used in many ways but now I'm um, just saying if there's hypothetically a fair system <laughs> that can determine if there's a serious security risk or something but yeah it's a very big slippery slope and I totally agree with what you said also it's what's leveled at us so frequently is that actually because of what you're saying about Islam or because of what you're saying about Muslims um, violence will now be enacted against Muslims because what you're doing is you're making Islam look really mean, you're making Muslims look really violent, and uh, therefore people are going to now target Muslims with violence. So I think 
I think we have to think about context. I think we have to think about what it is we're saying uh, and saying it responsibly. Yeah. So you know, I, I think perhaps Twitter isn't the most nuanced place, uh, and you're limited by a, a, a character count around that. But I think at the same time we have to be really careful around censorship. I think, I think where we've ended up is because we haven't been really careful around censorship. Well, I have to say that. In the United States right now, ex-President Trump is banned from Twitter and Facebook, and I'm very glad about it because he's really inciting things, because he's lying and uh, he's saying that he won the election. And so I'm grateful for the fact that at the moment they are quote-unquote censoring Trump. But uh, Halima, did you want to respond? And then we're going to open it up to the audience. Can, yeah, can, I, um, just, can I just say one thing on that? Like They're censoring Trump... But like, there's like Iranian ayatollahs on there who are saying actually kill people, and they're not censored. And this is what I mean. So like, it, it, it probably comes back to methodology then. But like, if you are happy that they're censoring Trump, I hope at least that you have the logical consistency to say that they should censor all of those other people as well. Personally, I don't think they should have censored for Trump. I think there's other ways to deal with it. Armin's like always saying the best answer to bad speech is like more speech, right? And, and I think that's such an important way of dealing with it because it, it's, it's, it makes no sense to be no Trump, but hey, <laughs> you can follow this dude who's saying kill the gays or uh, kill Salman Rushdie or uh, every, I think ISIS even had Twitter accounts at one point, right? Like <laughs> they, it's just nuts. Yeah, the Taliban as well. So, you know, I, I guess that doesn't make The situation in the United States is very combustible. We saw an attempted coup. It, they were very close to taking over our, uh, you know, not allowing an election to proceed. So um, I agree they shouldn't, it should be equal. They shouldn't allow, and I believe the policy isn't to allow that level of incitement by other people. But I'm still grateful he's not on, uh, because uh, the situation I'm, is is rather terrifying. I, I think one thing that we do have to consider is that as we move into the digital age, and blasphemy therefore moves into the digital age, we have a whole new set of contentions that we have to deal with in terms of, of course, saying these things on the platforms of private companies. So we're moving into whole different spheres, like where do we talk about these things in terms of principle and rights that we have as maybe citizens within a country, and then what does a private company decide to allow? And there's a whole other discussion about where the public sphere moves in terms of that that needs to be had, especially in terms of blasphemy, because many of these companies, like you know the big tech companies, they actively work with and participate with governments that criminalize people, perhaps even put people to death for their free speech and handing over information of users who made offensive statements, handing them over to their judiciary, putting them on a platter to be criminalized, persecuted. Despite commitments that they have signed at an international level, commitments to protect free speech. And there is a deep, 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 deep hypocrisy there and a, um, very insidious facade of trying to present to a free Western liberal audience, oh, we are here to pr promote free speech here, blah, blah, blah. But in India, we'll hand over your information to the government. In, in Pakistan, we'll hand over your information where they could put you to death. It's, it's um, insidious. I just want to add a bit more nuance. I remember going down to Speaker's Corner with Armin again, and we were engaging with some Islamists there. They had some pretty extreme views, and you know, one of them was actually apostates should be killed. I don't think we would have been able to have the conversations we needed to have if those people weren't able to say that. Now we have to open it up to the audience, and the um, will you will you handle that or okay, great. No, you, you asked a question, then you have to ask the question. Um, Maryam. Hi, thank you everyone for your amazing contributions. I just did want to make a point that there is, I think, a very clear line between 
speech that might be uncomfortable, that might even be offensive, versus inciting hatred and I think, inciting violence, sorry, and I think that is very key there. The problem is that a lot of religious texts are inciting violence. And I think that's where it becomes very difficult for us to maneuver. Uh, but the reality is that those who are religious have the right to say whatever the hell they want. It's we who are always um, silenced. And that's why I think it's important for us to defend free speech uh, and expression uh, in the most maximalist way, as long as there's no incitement to violence. I think someone made a very good point after Salman Rushdie's attack that words are words and violence is violence. And I think that is something that we need to be very clear of. I just want to tell you something very funny that happened. Um, um, I've, uh, you know, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, we've uh, made a woman's Qur'an, and it's blank because there's nothing good in the Qur'an for women. Uh, and sometimes when we feel, you know, like it, we make surahs, our own surahs of the woman's Qur'an. And uh, one of our most recent uh, surahs was of uh, a, a donkey with, uh, you know, his eyes blindfolded. And uh, the, the surah, surah basically said, Oh, you, ye believing men, if women's hair bothers you, a donkey's mask has been created just for you. And it's surah of the donkey <laughs> verse something women's bar on. Uh, no, but uh, the point I'm making, though, is that was banned by Instagram as hate speech. And when I appealed, they said it is still banned as hate speech. And that's the ridiculousness of the whole uh, debate. And that's why I think we have to say hate speech is not always hateful. And as long as it's critical of ideas, and even I think, you know, neo Nazis can criticize, uh, can defend their policies as long as it's not inciting violence. And I think that's where the law needs to be very clear. And that's where we need to, as free thinkers, draw the line. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a point, you know, about the term blasphemy, because I remember with Ina Shevchenko here, we decided five years ago, I think, or maybe less, I don't remember. But blasphemy, you know, it concerns only the people who believe in a religion. We when we don't believe in any god, you know, we, do, we don't use this term, you know. It doesn't concern me, you know. Blasphemy, it's not in the... When you live in a civil um, country with civil laws, there is no law about bla blasphemy. In France, there is no law in blasphemy. In Tunisia before and until now, we don't have a law concerning blasphemy, but I was accused to insult the person of God, you know, instead of blasphemy, because I just said neither Allah nor Master, you know. But I know that in Germany here, there is a law against blasphemy. I cannot imagine, you know, those country who said they are uh, free country, democratic countries from the West, you know, from Occident, they still have law against blasphemy. So please, if we are not believers, if we defend the free uh, expression, free speech, everything, we don't use this term, you know, it doesn't concern us. Thank you. Uh, I've just got one here. Question, please. Uh, <coughs> Hi. Uh, before question, I want to say free speech is free without limitation. With limitation, then we have to say free speech with limitation. Uh, I just want to ask you, you know, what's happening in the last five years or ten years in the West is very alarming uh, about free speech. Uh, like our Instagram channel, ex-Muslims of Norway, is banned and totally removed from Instagram. Now we have closed page to protect. And now I'm 29 days banned. Uh, but in any case, the problem is now, uh, I, do you think these countries who are making now uh, laws like Code 166 or in Norway we have other laws to uh, fight against hate speech, do you think they are really honest or it is a big product, product of Islamophobia business? Uh, because if they are honest, 
don't you think they should ban all religious books immediately first? The books which are uh, paid by governments to mosques, and there is, they're saying that I have to be killed. Kill who leaves Islam, they say. <laughs> and they say Jews are pigs and fight all unbelievers. And this book is allowed. Then is yes, we have free speech. They can be there, but we have to say what we can. And do you think they are honest? And who are they? I think yeah. in terms of um, if this is a s Islamophobia business, I love that, by the way, <laughs> um, or I Islamist business. Um, it, it very depends on the history of the country. Like some of these have been on the books for hundreds of years, and they've kind of um, are like dead letter laws. They might not necessarily be actively used. Um, but the problem is, even if they're on the books and they're not used, they are still used by people in Islamist governments, in Muslim majority countries, as validation and legitimizing their own push to silence speech within their own countries. And this is a massive concern because they can point to, hey, look at what Germany has. They, they're onto something in your so-called free country. They have it, so what's so bad about us having it? Why can't we have it? Is it only for you guys? You know. So I think it's very important that even if they are not actively used um, to uh, prosecute people, they have to be removed on principle. I want to push back a little bit against what uh, Jimmy mentioned. <laughs> so you're welcome to. Yeah. So this is actually a good thing, right? So the whole idea of blasphemy, Islamophobia, p pushing back against freedom of expression is to shut down conversations, right? But because of a lot of us had a lot of experience about our conversations being shut down, we sometimes confuse disagreements or being called out for our conversations being shut down. And we have to be careful not to overcorrect, right? Like I notice a lot of people within our community when they're being called out at maybe what they're saying is racist or homophobic or transphobic, are like, oh no, I'm being canceled, I'm being shut down, am I being silenced? No, you're just being called out. This is called, this is a dis discussion. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong to be calling this out as transphobia. Let's have this conf conversation. But it's very strange if you compare this to other people using the terms like Islamophobia as a way to shut down conversations, because this was not at all an attempt to shut down conversation, right? So when you, Jimmy, when you uh, mentioned like, oh, Islamophobia, and I agree with you, some people use the term transphobia as a way to shut down, shut down conversations. But then when you give the example of Atheist Republic, for example, calling out something transphobic, maybe wrongly, maybe you're correct. I'm, I'm really interested to have that discussion. But when you use that as an example, you're putting that next to some other people, there are transphobes out there, right? I do understand that transphobia is overused a lot, but we can't just throw away these terms as if there are no transphobes or homophobes or racists out there. One thing you did, for example, on Twitter, you compared my uh, criticism of some people that I maybe mis mistakenly called out as maybe transphobic, you compared that to me, to the Islamic Republic of Iran, the regime. You said maybe I should go back to those people. Like You are comparing me having an opinion and inviting a pushback to a regime that silences dissent with methods such as execution, which is not a very, like, I'm open to criticism. I'm not saying this is, what I'm saying is correct, right? But it's, I think, an, a very unfair crit uh, comparison. I think uh, one more question, but can it be a question, please? <laughs> Sorry, I know everyone's very passionate. I've got a lot to say, but thank you. Oh, I don't know if I've got a question. <laughs> but I've got the mic. Um, so I think it's a really, really tricky debate. What are the limits of free speech? I think there are limits. And I think there is a difference between hate speech and free speech on a legal level, but also at a cultural level. And a lot of what's being discussed about censorship and so on is um, at a cultural level. At a legal level, there are laws, and I think there ought to be laws. But I also want to say something about instinctively. I would approach the limits uh, between the boundaries between free speech and hate speech in relation to who has power. Because I think what we're missing from this debate is those who have the power not only to call out, but actually then the resources to enforce, the enforcers. And I, I'm very, you know, we're, we're all 
at the moment shocked and hor uh, horrified by what happened to Rushdi. And I remember back in 1989, when the fatwa was issued, when he published the satanic verses, nobody felt offended, not Muslims, nowhere. But it was the mullahs who decided that here was an opportunity to push a political agenda. So for me, a starting point about the limits of free speech is trying to work out who is saying it and for what political project. <clears throat> Can I? Oh, yes. Uh, we had a very interesting case, court case in Poland. The IKEA license, uh, I'm sorry, fired uh, an employee who uh, wrote on his business account um, some hate. Some, in fact, it was a quote from the uh, Leviticus book, very well known, that those who committed this abomination uh, shall be killed. It was the whole uh, quote. And in the first uh, instance of the labor code, uh, treated it, uh, this fireman, this, uh, the fact that uh, the man was fired as discrimination. And the whole right wing in Poland shouted that no one word from Bible is hatred it couldn't, it, and could not be uh, judged at the court. So my conclusion is just that if we cannot, like you yourself uh, suggested, we cannot just ban the Bible, at least we in our environment in, and in uh, the society should fight for that uh, the holy books are treated as the regular books, as the books like every other books without no more respect than others. Uh, hello, oh, it was a pleasure listening to all of you, thank you. Uh, I would like to talk about this little concept, I would like to hear your ideas about um, this concept that Popper talks about, um, the, the paradox of intolerance. So the, the basic idea is, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know it, uh, that we can't be really, uh, we can't have tolerance without limits, otherwise we will lose uh, what we have as freedom of speech. So we, we have to be intolerant towards intolerance. Otherwise, it's like a, a it's it's a contradiction. So the, the the good example you raised was the fatwa that Khomeini raised. So if we had laws against this sort of uh, speech, probably for 40 years, uh, Salman Rushdie wouldn't have lived this kind of life, and this wouldn't have happened to him. Or something even more important, like if Khomeini was silenced in Nafal Chateau, then for 40 years, Iranian people wouldn't have paid this really steep price of this because he was talking about intolerance towards women, you know, lo loads of things. Or if Hitler was silenced and he said that the Nazis were silenced because of, you know, raising these uh, misinformation about the Jews. So the whole planet wouldn't have paid that price. So what do you think? Do you think that we probably we have to pay this price that sometimes we will be silenced, it, probably a bit uh, unfairly, but that's the price we need to pay just... To, to keep the society going and you know, not, not to lose our freedom of speech. I don't know, if, what do you think about that? Thank you. Did anybody want to reply briefly? Two minutes left. Um, I think, of course, it's important. I always, in my head, it, it, it makes sense to, to look at it like, what common sense tells us about what the limits are, and and by common sense, I don't, I don't, I don't presume everybody has, you know. Uh, but I like to presume a lot of human beings have that common sense to say, okay, right here is 
is is actual uh, incitement, and right here is 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 free speech. So if we can, you know, um, go in that area, if that makes any sense. Can I can I just um, I, I think Miriam's point about actually. You know, if you're looking at these uh, religious texts, how much what would be defined as hate speech is within them, you know, that that's I think that's actually just completely sums up the inconsistency in the argument. And and for me, one of the beauties of these conversations is often I walk away and I think, oh, I need to recalibrate based on what was said. So it's good. So there's some pause for thought there. But in terms of calib recalibration, um, what the gentleman at the back said about you know what's happened in the West from the last five ten years. I think we get we need to get really clear about this idea of safety. You know, like we've taken maybe the idea of safety to this really bizarre level where words are violence, or even <laughs> silence is violence as well. Yeah, and so again, what Mamian was saying is that actually violence is violence, uh, and words are words. I think is very important, but perhaps we need to recalibrate recalibrate around resilience because we've really prioritized safety and i think physical safety really does need to be prioritized people's mental health also does need to be prioritized but at the same time we need to like champion resilience people need to be able to hear things that they disagree with however it makes them feel yes yeah so i think the problem is uh on how to define intolerance so the same way we were saying that if you criticize islam they can tell you that this is hate speech, they could tell you this is intolerant speech. Karl Popper is a big reference for me, he's the guy who came up with this uh, thing, but I cannot remember exactly how he defined intolerance, and I think he had a big chapter about this. But yeah, what I would say is like it goes in line with what we have discussed uh, during this uh, panel, which is, for me, whatever incites violence, this is what would be considered as intolerant. Other than that, I would say it falls under free speech, so, so I totally agree with the paradox of intolerance, but uh, we should be very careful on how to define intolerance. Thank you so much, everybody, um, and the audience for listening to this panel, and it's now concluding. Excellent. Thank you very much. Marvelous debate, a wealth of discussion here. Thank you. The panel uh, has been brilliant. I think the debate continues.